we kind of given away a subject that's been on my heart the last week or so in what we've sung this morning. <clears throat> Walking with God. Walking with God. It's a big theme and we can only touch on it. Uh, perhaps invite you and encourage you to maybe take a look at uh, some of the places We'll just glance at a few this morning where God makes it perfectly clear that he is asking, inviting, maybe even commanding and promising. He wants us to walk, to walk, to walk. That's simple enough, to walk with him. And let's just remind ourselves of a few of the scriptures which which guide our hearts into this set of mind that through good times through difficulties when we feel good when we don't feel good god invites us and enables us by his grace to walk with him do you remember in the garden this is a theme that runs right through the scriptures. We can only pick up one or two points when we're together. We have to sometimes just look at the scripture and remember to read it every day in our own time. But right back at the beginning, in the cool of the day, for that first man and woman, what did God want to do in the cool of the day? He wanted to walk with them. He wanted to walk with them. Now, <clears throat> you've got to be standing up to walk. And the trouble with Adam and Eve, those first men and women, is that they fell. They fell. That's a word we use. They didn't stay within the guidelines that God had given them as to how to live for his glory. He said, you can do all sorts of things, and I've given you a job to do, Adam, to look after the garden, but there are limits, parameters, in, within which to live your life. And Adam and Eve didn't help at all. Transgressed, he trespassed. He moved outside of the limits that God had set for him to live a life for the glory of the Lord. And they fell. They fell. But the whole story of the scripture really is God's sustained and we might put it this way, determined move to get human beings back to their original purpose. Because he made all of us, every one of us, with spirit and soul and body. And he made us to be that part of his creation which walks with God. Which is in communication, in communion with him. Amen. Now, it has been messed up by Adam and Eve. And you want an explanation of the mess that the world is in. And it doesn't seem to me to be getting any better. This book seems to fit the facts better than any psychology, better than any philosophy, better than any science. We were made for something better than just our immediate surroundings. We were made for more. Amen. Every one of us. God made you and me in his image. Now, sin has spoiled it a bit, but it's not, it's not spoiled God's purpose or the destination for every heart that comes face to face with the gospel 
and the facts that God has laid out to restore us to the purpose which he purposed for us, and that's in Christ. Let's just look at a few verses and I'll point you to some more and hope that and trust that we can wake ourselves up. Yep, I, I'm, I, was, I am loved by the King and he made me and my main purpose in life is to get to know the Lord, to learn his ways, to, to walk with the Lord. Let's look at this verse. This is from one of the prophets. <clears throat> it's just a very short verse. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. We'll look at some others. How, let's read it out. Can two walk together unless they be, are agreed? That's why God couldn't continue to walk with, um, with, with Adam after he became sinful because God is absolutely perfect, absolutely holy, absolutely loving. And that got spoiled. And God could not agree with where Adam and Eve's hearts had moved to. But he calls us, and that's what the gospel is really, a, a calling back to what God always intended for my life. So, so how can I come into agreement with the Lord and walk with him? Well, <clears throat> the gospel is all about the announcing of the fact that because he was determined to give you and I every opportunity and grace to enable us to be, well, ultimately, to be completely changed and to become a saint, a holy person, a person whom God is well pleased with. Well, I have to agree with, with, with who he is, what he said, and what he has done for me. And he did that in Christ on the cross when he gave himself for my sin. And that's it. And am and, um, I going to say, yeah, I agree. I look at the cross. I see how Jesus poured out his life to death, taking God's displeasure and offense at my sin upon himself. Do I agree with it? Yes, I agree. I agree. I agree. You did that for me. I agree. I agree. If I was an American preacher now, I'd say, talk to your neighbor and say to them, pat them on the back and say, I agree, I agree, I agree. Should we do that? We do it once, we won't do it very often. Speak, talk to your neighbor and say, I agree with God, I agree, I agree. Say, I agree, I agree, I agree. We're not very good at being American. But I do agree with the Lord, amen, amen. And if we can say, whether we understand it fully, whether we know everything that's implied in it, nevertheless, I agree. And God then is able to say, and he's been saying it to humanity since earliest human history, okay, walk, walk with me. When a man called Abraham was 99 years old, God said to him, walk before me. Walk before me. Walk before me, Abraham. And we know he did it because a few decades later, <clears throat> when Abraham sent out his servant <clears throat> to get um, a wife for his son Isaac, Abraham said, the Lord before whom I walk. Amen. 
And, and Abraham wasn't the only person in that, those early days of human history. Um, you can read about it. You can read about Noah. You can read about Isaac. They walked with the Lord. They walked with the Lord. Uh, what, does, what does walking imply? Walking, it's not wandering. It implies what? It implies direction. It implies progress. I'm moving from one place to another. I'm not static. I'm, I'm moving on. It implies a certain steadiness, doesn't it? Not going up and down. I'm just, I'm walking. Steady, progress, purpose, direction. Amen. Walk with me. Walk with me. <clears throat> You want to give me a thank you, thank you, Chuba. You, you are invaluable in so many ways, big ways and little ways. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's look at what we've been singing, shall we? It's a verse straight from the scripture. I know we've sung it a few times, but it's a great verse to get into our hearts and lodge there. Let's read it out. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run, not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. That's the beginning. Isaiah 40 is the beginning of the second part of Isaiah, which he foresaw the gospel age. You could say he was prophesying about people like you and me and what God can do in the heart and mind and life of people who didn't start from the place of walking with God at all. I certainly didn't. And I know my story will be echoed among us all. I love that verse because, first of all, there are, Isaiah is saying, there are moments, there are, there are times when, when the Lord really raises us up. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. There's an echo in what's being said there of when God brought his, his ancient people out of Egypt and he brought them to a, a, a Mount Sinai and he said, I'm coming into a relationship with you, a lasting relationship. And I brought you out. You can read this in Exodus 19. I, I brought you out. Your history, you think is a series of casual incidents and accidental things. God has had his hand on your life. That's why you are here today in church. Amen. Amen. And through all the mistakes and the wrong turnings and the injustices and the awful things that happen in life, God has had his hand on your life. In fact, he even says, I brought you out on eagle's wings. I don't expect some of those people who came out of Egypt and had been slaves, they didn't kind of think, well, eagle's wings, but they were. And God brought them out and God has brought you out of circumstances and impossibilities and difficulties and he's brought you to himself. And there's an elation in those verses. There's a lifting up on eagles' wings. And, and when, the, when the Spirit of the Lord comes to a human heart which has bowed the knee to Jesus Christ, it's like that when the Spirit of the Lord 
comes and he lifts up what was cast down. There are, there are, there are blessings in God which we cannot even imagine until we've tasted. Amen. But what this verse is saying, if you've been blessed like that, if the Spirit of God has come to you, if he's filled your heart and life, brought another dimension into your life which you would not have had had you not trusted in him. And God does that. But he also says, don't try to live on blessings. Don't try to live in some place in the clouds. No, I will bless you. I will bless you beyond measure. But what I want you to do is walk. By faith, steady, purpose. I know where I'm going. I know what my destination is. I know that someday I'm going to meet him face to face. And for now, I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk. Amen. It's a set of heart which says, I don't care whether I'm in a good time, I'm in a blessed time, I'm feeling comfortable, everything's going well, or difficult days, problems I can't solve, injustices which I can't fix, perhaps issues with this old physical frame, which is not quite the way I'd like it to be, and not always getting better. No. Nope. I've set my course, I'm going to walk with the Lord. Amen. Let's look at a few verses, and if I was inviting you to take some time to get a bit familiar with what the Lord has spoken to us, particularly in the New Testament, I mean, if you're going to be, let's use the word pilgrim. If you're going to be a bit of a pilgrim, somebody who walks day by day, situation by situation, challenge by challenge, I'm going to walk. Well, part of that is just taking some time every day, maybe just a few verses, get to know what God has spoken to us and recorded. Don't have to overdo it. In fact, what's the story of the hare and the tortoise? Who, who won the race? The hare or the tortoise? I'll have to explain that story to you. You know what a rabbit is, a hare? It runs very fast. How fast does a tortoise run or walk? Very, very slowly. And there's an old story about the hare and the tortoise. And who won the race? Tortoise. The tortoise. <laughs> because it's steady. Walking. Amen. And part of that should be that every day, it doesn't matter whether I feel like it, I'm going to open this scripture, start with the New Testament, I'm just going to read a few verses. Let them lodge in my heart and life. Let them shape who I am. Amen. It's a set of heart. A man called Tozer called it the set of the sail. And it's a lovely idea. You may have come across him. He was a writer, well known. And he talked about the set of the sail, the winds may blow, they may not. Sometimes they'll come, sometimes they won't. Sometimes I'll feel blessed, sometimes I won't. But I've set my course. Paul has got quite a lot to say about this. We can only read a few verses in Ephesians. 
And uh, <clears throat> let's just point towards them. Um, it's in the middle of Ephesians. Ephesians is a lovely letter. First, it it's divides into three main sections. The first section is learn that God has prepared a place for you to be enthroned even, to sit down. And uh, there's a very well-known book about Ephesians by a man called Watchman Nee. And he says there are three themes in Ephesians. Sit, sit down. Stop rocking the boat, sit down. Walk. And then the end of Ephesians is stand. Sit, walk, stand. So let's read some of the verses on sitting in Ephesians. And we're going to look at Ephesians. Can we go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1? <clears throat> I may not have given you that verse, Chubba, beforehand. Um, but I'll read it out. And if you've got a scripture, oh, thank you. He, let's read it out together. He has made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now walks in the sons of disobedience. Amen. Among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And we'll stop here. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There you are. There's the, there's the place of rest he's prepared for us. But he's also saying, listen, we were all like this in different ways, but we once walked according to what Paul calls here the course of this world, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. Amen. It's only those who have come face to face, I believe, with the Lord Jesus Christ and said, I'm going to trust him. I'm going to give myself to him. I believe him. Who can face the truth about the human condition. And the human condition is this. In the end, there will be sheep and there will be goats. And in the end, either... I have bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, invited him into my heart and life, opened up my heart so that he has put a new spirit in me. Either that or I walk differently. I walk aimlessly. I walk in vain. I, I walk according to, what does he say? It's, it's harsh stuff. The spirit which works in the sons of disobedience, and God is not okay with it. That's the gospel. But what he says to any person, anywhere, at any time, who says, I, I'm coming to you, Lord. I'm coming to you. He says, okay, I'll change you. I'll renew your heart. I'll forgive your sin. I'll, I'll change the way you act. I'll change the way you think. I'll fill you with a new spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's got that, that, that work of the Lord has, has more power in it than we can ask or even think. It has the power in it 
to present you and me faultless before him in that day. Amen. He has the power to change you and me now. Amen. So it's no surprise, really, that the pages of this book say, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Paul uses a lovely phrase about his... um, As he got older, the Lord raised up some younger men to help him, Titus and Timothy. And it's in the Corinthian letter. We won't turn to it. But I love where he says to the Corinthian church, he writes a letter to them, and he's saying, now, Titus is a good guy to, to, to listen to what Titus says. Why? Because we walked in the same spirit. Amen. That's, that's a great condemna- um, sorry, commendation. That's a great commendation. Well, there are lots of verses in, uh, in Ephesians. Let's just read a few. Um, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And he lays out in this letter to uh, these saints who were learning God's ways, learning to trust him, learning to live in a different way than they had lived before they knew the Lord. He sets out, um, he sets out some do's and don'ts of the Christian life. He, uh, he, he, in this letter, he, he, he sets out, he, here's what to do, and here was what not to do. And he's ever so practical, really practical. Um, let's read a couple of these verses. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the blindness of their heart. We'll stop there. Don't, don't walk that way. Don't walk that way. And nobody can ever accuse the word of the Lord recorded, and we're looking at some of Paul's letters here, of being impractical. I mean, we're talking about spiritual things. We're talking about the fact that every human being everywhere is is made in his image uh, a, a potential vessel to be filled with the spirit of the Lord. Well, you say that all sounds a bit spiritual, a bit, what's that got to do with me here? But what I love about Paul is that in the course of this letter, he also gets right down to earth and he says, um, uh, you you, you who were, you were a thief once, you stole things. Uh, Don't do that. I mean, you can't get more practical than that, can you? Right in the middle of this exalted passage about about things in heaven and and the powers of the air air, and how God has broken through and and made a way. And right in the middle of it all, he says, and uh, you, you, you stop stealing. It changes who we are. Couple more verses and then our time will have gone for this morning. So walk not foolishly, but as wise. Can we go to the next verse here? Um, or I'll read it if, if, uh, if I didn't give it to you. So I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> okay. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore... Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And 
don't be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. We cannot ever say, oh, you don't understand my, my circumstances, Lord. You, you, you don't know what it's like to be me. He knows everything about us. He knows our lying down. He knows our getting up. Amen. There is nothing more practical than being spiritual. It is not true that somebody can be too heavenly minded to be any use on earth. It's the other way around. You get to know God, he'll make your life real. I mean, look at this. Don't, don't, get, don't get drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. What an amazing thing to say. You can't accuse Paul of having his head in the clouds or, or not knowing what life was like. So don't, don't, start, don't, don't get drunk with wine. That's just, a, that's just a, a material thing, a temporary change in, in, your, in your thinking and it'll wear off pretty quickly and it'll leave you worse off than before. Don't get drunk with wine, but, so you're gonna leave us in a vacuum? You're gonna leave us, no, be filled. Be filled with the Spirit of God. And if I'm filled, if I'm filled, what will happen? I'll start speaking to other people about Jesus. If, I, if I'm filled, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I won't be singing worldly songs anymore. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful, I won't be singing. No, I'll be singing happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. That's why it's good that we learn songs, get them embedded in us because, amen. When I walk with the Lord in the light of his word. I think we should sing that, don't you? What glory, what glory he sheds on our way. Be filled with the spirit, amen. Walk before him. The early chapters of this book do record initially after God made everything, a sad story of a human fall. But you only have to read on a little way. And this book records, men began to call. They began to call on the name of the Lord. And, and right from those early days of humanity, there were those who said, I, I, um, I'm gonna learn to walk again. I'm gonna walk with the Lord. There was a man called Enoch. Anybody know the story of Enoch? Well, you put, let's put, thank you for putting the verse up. Let's read it. This is in the early chapters of Genesis. Before Noah, before, before Abraham and Isaac, there was a man called Enoch. And let's read this out. Enoch walked with God. There it is. Enoch walked with God. And something remarkable happened, rather like Elijah. He was not. Enoch, how can we say it? Enoch, Enoch was a was not. God took him. Amen. I'll take that person because he's walked with me. 
and he'll take you and me. He'll take us for himself. In that day, he will have a people to be with him forevermore. And who will those people be? The people who've walked. Amen. I know where I'm going. I know his grace can get me through anything. When we walk with the Lord, I think we should sing it, don't you? Amen. Let's sing it. Um, and you sing it as a response to the Lord. Amen.